Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the downturn of the economy and has it been caused by the millennials not wanting to buy cars as the finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman has said. Somebody else has pointed out that we seem to be dipping in terms of sales from biscuits to booze to bikes. Yeah. On, on in the, so is it also the millennials don't want to buy bikes as well or biscuits? It it appears that they do. They do also don't want to buy booze. You know, one would have imagined that uh, they were. They probably take Ola cabs once in a while when they're, you know, with the laws that there are for traffic. So, if booze is going down, biscuits are going down, and you know, this entire thing is at best a spin. And we know that the data shows that uh, millennials want to buy cars because they are buying used cars. So essentially, this is, shall we say, headline management. I think Manmohan Singh has called this, that the government should spend more time with the economy than managing the headlines. Would you say this is another of those exercises? Well, they have obliging media to, uh, you know, to oblige them and pass on a certain kind of create or manufacture consent. For, and therefore, when you have that kind of an obliging media out there, of compliant and pliant media out there, why wouldn't you manage headlines? I think that, that it's great that you say something and then it comes out exactly in the same fashion. You know, when you say manufactured consent, I think you're being too kind. Yes. We, at the moment, are not manufacturing consent. We're no. actually manufacturing myths. Absolutely. That the mythology yeah. is not just about the past, yeah. but the mythology is about the present as well. Exactly. And the economy is a classic example of that. Yeah. We managed to, shall we say, tweak the GDP figures yeah. <laughs> by changing the baseline, as yes. we know, for yeah. a lot of issues. But you can do it only once. You can show that now we've gone to a new baseline, which shows that the past three years, we did better than anything else that happened earlier. And what happened is that it pushed up Chidambaram's performance as well. I mean, that, that was one of the side effects of side <laughs> trying to side do that. Effects. So now, yeah. of course, he has, they have, he has to be put where he is yeah, in yeah. order to, shall we say, d diminish that luster. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, the point that I'm making is you can do this once, yeah. but if you do it, if you look at it in a longer time frame, hmm. finally the trend cannot be hidden because one time repair, yeah. shall we say, of this kind hmm. cannot go into a long term change because ultimately the baseline can shift, hmm. but it cannot change your trajectory. Is that what we're seeing now? I think that uh, m not just the data, the data manages headlines, as you said, and th that data can very easily be questioned. Because if you remember, I think the Prime Minister's advisory, advisory Council came out with a report in which it gave the back series. And that uh, report was deleted from the website. And it was said, this is not official. And a new back series was released, which showed lower growth in the previous years than what was shown by the Prime Minister's. Uh, advisory Council's own report. And uh, so there is that headline management which quickly therefore disappears because journalists are not doing their job, they're not asking the questions and they're actually propagating what the government wants. But at the end of the day, if people cannot buy biscuits, if people are not buying cars, if they're worried that the next day when they go to work, if their boss tells them that you have to stay till 12 at night and they say, no, I can't because my child is unwell, they can't say it anymore because they f they're scared that they'll lose their job. So no amount of headline management, no amount of numbers management is going to change that feeling that people have at this moment. Well, that headline also said, the Economic Times headline yeah. you're talking about, I think you said the big Germans, yeah. yeah. also talks about bikes and briefs. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. they are really far more yeah. fundamental. Yeah. Absolutely. And it does also show not only the automobile sector, which of course no, is no, the, the key, key sector being hurt, partly because from cycles to trucks, all yeah. of this has fallen. But if you look at, for instance, housing, now that has taken exactly. a huge hit. Yeah. That takes a hit, then steel and cement take a yes, hit. Yes, absolutely. And these are the key sectors of the economy. Yeah. Now, in this, it's clear that demonetization really killed the informal sector or deeply damaged the informal sector. And absolutely. this is also now becoming much more visible. Absolutely. I think one of the things that, uh, just to go back to the point that you made about briefs and bicycles and biscuits, uh, another economic columnist, Andy Mukherjee of Bloomberg, he, uh, uh, I think, mentioned on social media, or probably he wrote about it, how toothbrushes, the replacement of toothbrushes, that cycle has increased. 
So people are not replacing toothbrushes. They're moving, there is more data to show that people are moving from, um, you know, higher branded soaps to smaller soaps. So everywhere this is happening, toothpaste is not selling. We know that uh, the phenomenon Baba Ramdev of Patanjali, right? What has happened to him? His uh, urban sales this year is negative. Growth is negative. B rural sales growth is half of what it was last year, right? So I'm saying all over we see that FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, it's declining. Uh, last quarter in their investor call, Hindustan Unilever actually said that they use what is called the R word, the recession word, which no one in the stock markets wants to hear. And they said that we are slow down proof, I think they said. Uh, we are recession resistant, but not recession proof. Now, why would they go out and use that word unless they're feeling the pinch? Uh, coming back to the point that you raised about housing. Now, we know that what housing does is that it creates, it's one of the biggest generators of employment, bad quality employment. It's not as if it's great quality employment. We know how workers in the housing sector actually live, exist. And, uh, but it's still employment, especially for people who in the non-harvest or the non-sowing season do not have work. So they Seasonal come, yeah. workers. So they come, they work, they get money, and then they go, send part of that money. They also do things which uh, are uh, kind of invisible. Like, for instance, there's a house that was being built opposite my house. And every morning I used to hear these Bhojpuri songs, right? And because there are options available, you can actually buy a SIM only to listen to songs. So people would buy multiple SIMs when they came to the city. They would make long distance calls. They would buy SIMs to just listen to music or to watch YouTube on their phones because that's the life that they lead. When they go away, what happens? That also collapses. Forget about the guy who was sitting there, sitting there selling tea in the morning or bread and an omelet to the workers out there or makes rotis and sells them in the evening. That guy is dead too. I mean, that business is dead. We know that after demonetizations across cities, you would see vendors having shut shop and gone. CMI's report actually showed a drop in unemployment. This is interesting because as we know, unemployment is a function of labor force participation rate. So as Mahesh Vyas wrote that the amazing thing is that unemployment actually dropped after demonetization because people left. They were no longer participating in the labor uh, they were, they, they so were they were not looking for jobs. So if out of 100, earlier 50 people were looking for jobs and 42 were getting it, now 40 are looking for jobs and 38 are getting it. So the, it looks like the unemployment rate has gone up, but actually people are just so, uh, the conditions are so dismal that they've left. And this actually probably started earlier, but definitely demonetization is a kicker which really affected the rural economy because people who would come to urban areas didn't have jobs and they went away. It had a great political uh, dividend for the BJP, but... Yeah, because yeah. it was felt that this is a real strike against black money. Yeah. And it took people three years to realize yeah. it wasn't. By that time, the narrative had changed to Pakistan and so on. Exactly. So you could tide over that yeah, to yeah. surgical strike. No, even, so even in 2017 in the UP elections, there was a benefit because what it did is that in an Indira Gandhi-esque fashion, Narendra Modi was able to project himself as, in fact, he said that wo kehte hain, Modi hatao, main kehta hu, garibi hatao. Which he used exactly the line that Indira Gandhi had used. So. so it was, in fact, at that point of time, it was really felt yes. that he has mm. done such a grave, mm. uh, he's taken such a grave step, inflicted so much pain on us. Mm. It must be in the long run good for, leading good for dividend the, yeah. for the nation. And they're willing to... And uh, maybe there was a pain. bit of schadenfreude as well. I mean, yeah. there's been so much inequality yeah. that has developed there, over there, a period of time. There is this argument, the rich are suffering also, so I yeah. feel... Yeah, happy. I feel. Yeah. So that has been argued yeah. that that was yeah. there. Yeah. Mm. But Without that, I would say there the was basic also, yes. thing was that they felt this was a strike against yeah. various things like hoarding cash, black Absolutely. money. Absolutely. People believed black money was money. Yes. They did yeah. not really believe that yeah. black money was gold, well, was a or house, property, exactly. Property of different or in countries. a bank. Or actually or in, in a bank. bank. Yeah. The bank. And as we know now, the black money strike didn't lead into anything. Yeah. Mm. But nevertheless, it made people feel at the time that something was going to yes. happen, which hasn't. Yeah. But it did affect the informal economy greatly. Greatly, absolutely. And that has the consequence we are seeing today in terms of mm. its negative fallout on the economy. So I would actually say that 
even more than demonetization, it's actually GST which has had a worse impact. In fact, demonetization, we know within one year, more or less, the cash was returned into the system. And, uh, uh, you know, there is an informal arrangement that happens in the rural areas, definitely. I know some of my uh, friends who are, uh, you know, who uh, were, are essentially grain traders. One of my friends, his family is a grain trader. He's a journalist, but his family is a grain trading family. So I said that how is it being, how is demonetization affecting? So informal credit systems Credit operate. systems existed. And at times like these, actually there's an informal, I would say, what would be called a moral economy that comes into play. Yes, there's an exploitative relationship. It's not as if it's, but they're it's very... Still, though cash is not a big exchange, yeah. there is still an exchange of but goods But what GST has done is essentially, what GST has done is essentially killed the small entrepreneur. You know, this is something which people haven't really understood. Yeah. And I think I would like you to explain this a bit. Yeah. What it has done is that circulation of money yeah. that a small person makes, yes. that has been held up yes. because it's now, if it takes, say, for instance, three cycles for him to realize back his GST benefit, yeah. that means a huge part of his working capital it's is stuck. locked up yes, in the absolutely. GST payments. And that is not a net loss. But it's a loss of a circulation. It's, it's, it's essentially exactly what you're saying. Now, the interesting thing is, again, that uh, it's not just small entrepreneurs who have been affected by that. I, there are a lot of middling people who actually probably make two, one or two crore rupees in terms of their retained profit a year. I'm not saying their income, personal income, but even they, they don't, basically what happens is that uh, GST makes you pay taxes in advance or every month, even if it's not in advance, every month. Now, what it does is that you realize the input credit that you have is refunded to you after 60 days. And we know that it hasn't been refunded at all, which is why the finance minister has in this budget and later in her mini budget said that we'll return it in 60 days. That means it wasn't returned. So working capital has actually been, I mean, there are people in the stock markets, great votaries of this government who have said that all we need is the government should return the money, that it is locked up in GST. It's been locked up for six, seven, eight months. Now imagine that if you've paid, I, I was actually asking, I know vegetables are not a part of GST, it's out of that system. I asked my local vegetable vendor called Pavan that, uh, what is your total turnover and how much you... So he said that I, key, I make, as in my profit, is about, I would say, 1,000 to 1,500 rupees, depends. So I make about 35,000 rupees a month. But my turnover is approximately 15 to 20,000 rupees, which is dhanda, as he says. Per day. Per day. So 20,000 into 30, you can imagine takes you to, uh, what, 70 odd lakh rupees a year? Yeah. Right? yeah. That puts you into GST bracket. Now, obviously, vegetables are not in that. But there are many, many, many businesses which are like that. Let's say carpenters, right? Carpenter, you do that, you ca no one's going to take you because they don't get input credit if they bought things from you. So a bigger business is not going to buy from a smaller vendor simply that's, because... That's the part. Yeah. That, in fact, it forces you to buy from bigger parties, and that's a second strike against the informal sector yeah. because they, they not cannot provide services easily yeah. because that input credit then doesn't come to the... So what has happened is, as I was reading in a paper, that 50%, uh, approximately 50%, I think 40 to 50% of people who are below the threshold have registered for GST. Because Precisely being because outside the threshold, uh, not registering for GST means they won't get business. Now, what happens? You're a small person. You have paid uh, GST. You pay GST. Your income is lower than that. So what do you do? You go to a bank, claim working capital loans, pay GST with that. You're finished in three months. So industry under ind after industry has got so, finished. So this part of the equation is not yeah. so easily understood, shall we say, but what's called the pink papers. Yeah. Because they are not the people who are dealing with this. Again, I don't know whether it's not understood because they understand that this is a process by which it leads to formalization. Uh, they're happy with that. They're happy with that. Right. Now we know formalization increases inequality. It's as simple as that. The truth is that in a country like ours, 
if the small entrepreneur has to pay full taxes, he cannot compete. He or she cannot compete. Let's we know that. Let's put it this way. Here, we are not talking, uh, talking about full taxation. We are simply talking about yeah. GST. GST, which exactly. Which held. Yeah. Even if he wants to pay taxes in full, yeah. we are talking about yeah. working yeah. capital. Yeah, GST, exactly. And because he circulates his capital very fast, yeah. he survives. Yeah. If he can't circulate it fast, he's finished. And that's also yes. the small but the smallest, But the smallest of the people, the smallest of the people... Uh, someone told me an example, gave me an example that there was a, an office which would basically buy tea from the vendors outside the office, right? And distribute it inside the office. Now, there's a limit on the amount of cash that you can, uh, transaction that you can do uh, in a day. So they said that if we buy tea from this person in cash, our cash is getting locked up in this because we can't get input credit on the tea we're buying. So what they did is they put a machine. So that guy shut down. So they, these are things which Small occur. Small things which are shifting. Yeah. But you know, Modi government's main credit is they are formalizing the economy, which is why mm. they've got, shall we say, support from the uh, the pink press yeah. and uh, the relatively well-off sections. Leaving that part mm. out for the mm. time mm. being, you know, we'll come back to yeah. this another day. Mm. The last point that they wanted to uh, talk about is you talked about the R word, recession. Yeah. Now, the argument has been that since economies like India are still growing, yeah. they are not stable Absolutely. big economies. Yeah. Therefore, what we should look at is not recession, but growth recession. And what we are seeing clearly is growth recession that we are coming to the lowest growth for in the last six years, even government statistics. Yeah. We are seeing a loss of demand, which is only increasing yeah. and you are seeing already three and a half lakh, uh, 350,000 people unemployed Absolute. in the automobile sector. Yeah. You already had a recession in the uh, housing sector. Yes. And you also saw the public sector, which could be used to pump the prime. Yes. Uh, pump, uh, prime, prime pump. Yeah, yeah. That their surplus has been taken away in terms of buying Absolutely. other public sector. Yeah, exactly. Which means what the government has done is to cover its... Uh, deficit by using the resources of yeah. the public sector, yes. which means that they cannot also now create demand because they, can, they don't have the capital. That Absolutely. money has been taken. Absolutely. Now, this all of it means today hmm. that you don't really have an ability to prime the pump. Absolutely. And what you are seeing, if it also translates into shortfall of uh, tax revenue, yeah. and uh, this is what the GST revenue seems to show, Absolutely. that yeah. you have a fall, mm. then the question is, how do you make this up? This is the key crux, key question so, uh, that we have now. So I would uh, argue that, uh, and this is being argued by people from the left and the right, that uh, in a situation like this, where you might not have a recession because technically it will have to be two quarters of negative growth or to, to be called. It I mean, like what I mean. In low, yeah. Uh, I mean, it the, might not have, but it is true that sectors of the country are facing recession. Negative. So it might not be an overall, but automobile sec uh, industry has negative growth. We know certain places which has negative growth. Uh, and I think large number of people have negative growth of real income, right? So. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, point is that in a situation like this, I think that all you have to do is print notes. I know I said this. Well, that, on, is, that is what they did by taking away the Reserve Bank surplus. Yeah, exactly. Is that really is exactly what they notes. did. That's exactly what they did. And uh, the point is that this is not an argument made by, uh, you know, heterodox uh, economists or left economists. This is being made by Ben Bernanke. It was made by Larry Summers, you know. The last people to be called leftist, right? The point is you have to forget about this ridiculous thing called the FRBM, which tells you that you have to keep reducing your fiscal deficit to, I think, bring it down to 2% or something over a period of time. No government believes in that. And therefore, they push their actual expenditure onto other entities which are not in that balance sheet of the budget. Now, the point is you have to forget about it. The only two years where we have had good growth and employment, actually, are the two years when the UP actually uh, pay, spent money. It gave that stimulus. Without that, there is no way at all that you can do anything about it. And sorry. The problem that lies, of course, in that is the fin global financial markets. Yes. Yeah. don't like this. And India 
or at least the people in power at the moment, mm. including the people in the Reserve Bank, actually feared the, uh, shall we say, the unhappiness exactly. of, of, the of rating agencies more rating than anyone else. Agencies. So they are not so afraid of the people as of the rating so agencies. So here's another thing that let's look at what rate, why governments are scared of rating agencies. Because what happens is that the risk premium attached to a equity market that goes up. So essentially, the money flows out automatically. Now, since a lot of the money that is being put into India are through passive funds where there's no active thing, they look at there's probably an algorithm out there which is putting in money. So when the risk premium goes up, the money will flow out. So therefore, uh, it, that's their fear. The truth of the matter is that in 2009-10, when money was put into the markets, this, I think the Sensex had dropped to below 10,000 or something like that. It was somewhere around 9,000. It went up to uh, whatever, to, uh, 21, 23,000 uh, points, right? So it's people come looking for earnings. So if you have earnings, they are going to come. Whether you <laughs> do it through, uh, as you said, fiscal deficit, printing notes, it doesn't matter. The idea that they won't like it is true. They don't like it because it appears then that why do you need the private sector? If the state can do all this, why do you need that's this their fear. This is the issue that capitalists don't like it. Yeah. And that but they love it when the earnings of companies go up. They yeah. come in but and... I'm saying that basically because they believe mm. that they are by the getting capital will become more expensive. Therefore, you have to keep the uh, Which gods is, of capital, yeah. essentially the financial uh, markets, happy. By Which again is an absolute myth because whatever no, the... We are, only yeah. we are on the same side yeah, of that. Exactly, yeah. I'm saying the yeah. orthodoxy Absolutely. as you get the heterodoxy. Yeah. This is the orthodoxy. Yeah. That is a conservative view. But the, or, the, the orthodoxy today is saying... I think that it's only the orthodoxy in India which still holds on to this. If you look at what the American orthodoxy is saying, what the European or other than the bank heads, everyone is saying spend. Well, don't forget yeah. the Germans. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Germans are not in yeah, this camp yeah, either. Yeah. Thank you, Anindo, for being with us. Thank you so much. We have to continue this conversation for much longer. Yes. Because as we yeah. know, mm. the clouds of recession are only going to be darker. Yes. It doesn't look like mm. it's going to light, be lighted in the short run. Not with the policies we still see of managing headlines but not managing the economy. Thank you very much for Thank being you with for us. Having me. This is all the time we have at News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and visit our website.